This is Mrs. O'Neill for AP Chemistry, Chapter 15, Section 2, the equilibrium constant. And your objective for this section is to understand what an equilibrium constant is based on the rates of forward and reverse reactions and how this equilibrium constant expression is for the homogeneous reactions. In the early 1900s, German chemists refined the process of making ammonia from elemental nitrogen and hydrogen. This process allows the manufacture of nitrogen fertilizers. You will learn how reaction conditions can influence the yield of a reaction. So this is called the Haber process, taking nitrogen and hydrogen, mixing them together to get ammonia, which is very, very useful for fertilizers and many, many other things. So you're going to see this process, this, this Haber reaction, multiple times throughout this chapter. So the equilibrium constant is expressed as K, KEQ, or KC. Your book uses KC, and it's also KC on your reference sheets. So these two men came up with what's called the law of mass action, and that's just this equation. So at this point, pause the video, fill in your blanks, and then play to hear my words. So the law of mass action is taking your reaction and putting it into an expression called the equilibrium expression formula. So if you notice, it's the products over reactants, but it's the product to its coefficient as an exponent. It's the product to its coefficient as an exponent. And we also want to remember, I want to bring this to your attention, it's only for gases. So if all four of these substances were gases, they would all be included in this equation. However, if A, for some reason, if this substance was a solid, it would not be included at all because solids and liquids have a constant, um, is constant, so solids and liquids are constant, so they are not going to play a part in this equilibrium. So read, pause the video, and see if you can come up with an, uh, an answer. You should at this point. The concentrations no longer are changing. So the rate of the forward equals the rate of the reverse. And again, it's the amount of reactants and products that don't change anymore. It's those concentrations. So what happens if we write the reaction in reverse? Well, what happens to that reaction? Now we have products over reactants still because we're still writing an equilibrium expression. So in the reverse, we would have the AB on top and the CD on the bottom. But if that happens, then what happens to that K value, the, the actual value, the amount that we get for K? Well, it's going to be the inverse, so it's going to be 1 over. Oops, sorry, I'm going to go back to that real quick. This is going to be important later on, understanding what happens to that K value as we um, change our concentration numbers, change our temperature. It's going to be really important. So this is our example one. I've already given you that information of how the products to the coefficient exponent times the product to its coefficient exponent. Just want you to be able to uh, just get that expression of K, products over reactants. I want to make sure that you're understanding they're being multiplied by each other and that the exponent is the coefficient of that specific substance. So pause the video, see if you can come up with that equilibrium expression. Hopefully that's what you got. Products over reactants. Each product has its own exponent according to its coefficient. This coefficient is one, so we do not have to write that in. How about number three? This one's a little tricky. There's some, some substance in there that hmm, you should be thinking about. And hopefully that caught your attention. You are not going to put SiO2 in there because it's a solid, so only gases. So hopefully, hopefully that, 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 that's going to strike a nerve and that's going to get into your brain cells there. Okay. So how do we calculate this, uh, this constant, this equilibrium constant? Well, here we have number one. We have a vessel. Here's our reaction. It's at equilibrium. We see that because of the um, arrow, that special arrow. I'm giving you moles. Hmm, but that should ring something too. Because I'm giving you moles and I'm giving you one liter, remember that that equilibrium expression is based off of concentration. So each of these moles needs to be divided by one liter 
uh, to make the molarity. And in this case, the moles equals molarity because you're dividing by one liter. But I just wanted to bring that to your attention because not all the time that you're going to be given molarity. You're going to be given moles maybe and maybe two liters. Uh, then you have to change to molarity. And again, this is going to be important in the future when we're dealing with our ice boxes. So then it's a matter of just plugging and chugging. So again, pause the video, see if you can come up with the equilibrium expression, put in the correct values, and see if you get the correct number. And that should make sense, okay? It's an odd number, or I should say a weird number, but you're going to see numbers are going to be really, really tiny, and some numbers are going to be really, really big. So don't worry about that. Just make sure that you have the correct equation, putting in the correct numbers, making sure that you're using your exponents correctly, and multiplying. So again, there's no unit, and this would be the equilibrium is greater than 1, so the products are favored. Aha! You're going to see more information on this in the next uh, section, but think about this. If your ratio is products over reactants and you have a bigger number than 1, then that means the top number of that ratio is going to be big. If the top number is big, that means we have more products than reactants, so the forward reaction is favored. And yes, your KEQ, your constant, uh, does not have a unit in this case. So let's look at the pictures here. Let's look at this on a molecular level. So here we have our SO2 and O2 as reactants. We're not at equilibrium yet. So we're going to react to give that SO3. Again, not at equilibrium yet, right? So here we have our reactants. We form some products. Now these products are going to have enough energy and there's going to be enough of them to start decomposing into, that, um, into those reactants again. So now we're at equilibrium because all three molecules are present. The um, sulfur dioxide, the oxygen, and the sulfur trioxide, and it's to the correct amounts of um, coefficients, right? Your correct mole ratio. So that's another thing to think about. We need two SO2s, which we have. We need, um, uh, where we are here, uh, oh, they're giving us three, four, two, four, and one. Uh-oh, um, I don't know why they have four there, uh, but you, you get the gist, and again, later on, that's going to be important, because sometimes the AP exam just gives you these pictorials, and you have to actually decide which picture is the correct picture according to the coefficients, according to that mole ratio. Okay, so now let's look at those graphs again. Here's those graphs. So the one is concentration versus time, okay? They're both concentration versus time. Uh, so here again, we have zero products and it gets formed. Here we have lots of reactants and it decreases. So that should make sense. And again, same thing over here, just kind of showing it in a different way as we're increasing and decreasing. But what happens is, you know, once the reaction, or I should say once the concentrations um, are a flat line, that's when equal equilibrium occurs. So now pause the video, read over this A, B, and C questions, and see if you can come up with some answers. And hopefully that makes sense. Hopefully you got those answers and that makes sense. So here's our example two. Uh-oh, now I'm giving you the equilibrium constant. I'm giving you two concentrations. So I want to know what's going to be my concentration of Cl2. Again, pause the video, see if you can do this. This is a matter of forming the correct equilibrium expression, plugging and chugging your numbers, rearranging a little bit, and forming an answer. And hopefully you got that. So our initial, or I should say our equilibrium concentration amount here for chlorine would have been 0 0.67 molarity. Don't forget your unit there because it's asking for molarity. Again, I'm going to remind you that the chemical or the, the, the equilibrium expression um, does not have any units. 
So what is the difference between this and what I just showed you? Well, this deals with pressure. Because we're dealing with gases, we can also deal with an equilibrium expression, but dealing with gases. So notice now, instead of brackets to show molarity, it is actually just regular um, parentheses. And again, the expression is the same, but now we're going to be dealing with pressure. And usually it's atmospheres. It might be something else, but it's usually atmospheres because it's dealing with the partial pressure um, and standard, um, but it can also give you other uh, units, you know, like KPAs or uh, millimeters of mercury, uh, but usually they give it to you in atmospheres. So instead of concentrations, if they're giving you gas pressures, you might have to use this very same equilibrium expression, but now we're just using um, atmospheric units. So again, what did I just tell you? Can you answer this? So that should make sense. So you have two equilibrium expressions. One is just going to be based off of concentration of your reactants and products, which that's the one we're going to use most often. But just know that there's another K expression just dealing with pressures because, again, we're dealing with gases. We're not dealing with solids and liquids. They are not part of the expressions. So if they give you something like, ooh, you might have to do a PV equals NRT. Again, multiple steps. Find the pressure of each individual reactants and products, and then plug and chug to find the actual concentration, uh, I'm sorry, the, um, uh, the equilibrium constant uh, value. Okay, see you in class.